Hi everyone, my name is Oscar and I'm a scientist and in today's video we're going to talk about two green card categories that allow you to self-petition where you can be the owner of your green card process. Let's take a look. So EB1 A and EB2 NIW are the two categories we're going to touch on today. I usually talk a lot about EB2 NIW in this channel but I will slowly also introduce some EB1 videos because I think it's a really interesting option for many people like we will see today. So let's talk about similarities and differences between these two green card categories. I'm going to start with similarities, at the end we'll cover the differences and then we'll have some conclusions to help you decide what makes sense for your case. So in terms of similarities these two green card, well, first of all, both of them are green card um, processes. So the end result is getting a green card, permanent residency, and is the same. So if you get your green card through EB1, it, it has the same effects that if you get it through EB2, or even, we're not talking about those today, but EB3 and EB4. So it doesn't really matter, even if it's family or employment based, at the end of the day, once you get the green card, it is a green card, okay? So, um, these two types of green cards, EB2 and AW and EB1A, are for highly skilled individuals or highly skilled professionals. So, it means that as part of the requirements for them, you're supposed to have um, either advanced degree or show that you are really well positioned in your field, and that is true for both. EB1A, um, is for individuals of extraordinary abilities and later I'm going to cover what USAS means by extraordinary and EB2 and IW is for applicants that have, that, that have either an advanced degree, master or PhD or bachelor plus five years or if they don't have those they can prove they have exceptional abilities and again later I'm going to show you what I mean, what they mean by exceptional abilities because USAS considers exceptional and extraordinary two different things. So another similarity between EB1A and EB2NAW is that you can self-petition. That means that you don't need a job offer in order to apply for this green card. You can submit your I-140, you don't need a labor certification. I'm going to cover that in the next slide. This makes these two green card processes really appealing for people that work in organizations that don't want to sponsor them for a green card or people that are abroad, that directly they are not in the United States, they live somewhere else and they want to immigrate in the United States and they don't have a job offer available to them. But they are highly qualified so they can still get their residency through this uh, type of green card. So going back to what I said in the previous slide, you don't need a labor certification. So typically here on the right side, we see the, the, the typical process for an employment-based green card. There are three main steps to, to this process. The first one is called PERM or labor certification, and this is usually done by the employer where they um, have to do uh, some bureaucratic uh, steps with the Department of Labor to get what is called a prevailing wage for the position you are going to occupy. They have to test the market for US workers to make sure that you are not quote unquote stealing a job from an American worker. And then they have to submit this perm and obtain the final approval from the Department of Labor. And only then you can file an I-140 and after your I-140 is approved, you can proceed to adjust status if you are in the US or proceed to consular processing if you are abroad. Now, with EB1A and EB2 and IW, your process starts in the I-140. You will jump uh, over this perm. You don't need that perm. They are waiving that for you, and you start in the I-140, so there's one less step in the process. And this is quite significant, not only because, because you don't need uh, this sponsorship from a company, but also in terms of time, um, this uh, prevailing wage from the Department of Labor typically takes six to eight months to, to be obtained. And then uh, your company needs to test the market for a couple of months. There is a chance that uh, they will audit the company, that there will be some denial and that will put you back at the beginning of the process again. 
overall it will take about or even more than one year for just this process. So with these two categories you not only don't need a company to back you up but you already started in the i140 so you really have less processing time. It's also, um, these two processes are also potentially less expensive than other green card applications because you can self-sponsor and that also means not only that you don't need a company to sponsor you but you don't need to hire lawyers. You can, that is an option that you have, you can go um, look for a lawyer that really appeals to you, that you think is good for your case but, but you don't need to, you can do this by yourself. And that's why I created this channel and my website db2naw.info to help you navigate this process and to help those people that want to avoid uh, hiring a lawyer and they want to do it themselves. And this has uh, a big consequence in terms of cost because the attorneys are typically the highest cost in a green card process. So typically the total cost of a process with a lawyer will be above $10,000. But if you do your own application, it will be between two and three thousand dollars without a lawyer. Of course, that's highly dependent on when you're watching this video because there are plans now to increase some of those fees. Um, so you can watch my video on the proposed USAS increase of, uh, on the fees. And you can also check out my video where I break down all the costs of a green card process and that may be helpful to you to understand where these two to three thousand dollars come from, where this ten thousand dollar or higher come from. Okay. Another similarity between these two categories is that you have to prove that you will benefit the country. Both EB1A and EB2NIW require that the applicant show how their work will impact the US positively, of course. So I, I took a couple of quotes here to illustrate this in the EB1A category. USAS says, the person's entry must substantially benefit the United States in the future. And in EB2NIW, we all know the second prong of Danazar is the proposed endeavor is of substantial merit and national importance. So in, so in both of these categories, in your petition package, in your cover letter, you will have to argue why your work is going to impact the US in a positive way. Let's talk about the differences now because there are differences between these two green card categories. The difference that I think is the most evident is that one of them talks about extraordinary abilities and the other one talks about exceptional abilities. These two terms in our everyday life we don't really differentiate them, but for USAS these are two different standards. EB1A is a higher standard to meet. Let's, let's say that it's more difficult to meet that standard. So EB1A applicants, they have to prove that they have extraordinary abilities. And this is the definition by USAS. Extraordinary ability is one of the small percentage who have risen to the very top of the field of endeavor. So if you are applying for this green card, you have to present yourself and you have to prove that you are at the very top of the field. You are not only above average, but you are really, really, really at the top of, of the field. In EB2 and IW, because it's a um, lower standard, uh, the applicants can either meet the advanced degree rule, and that's having a master's or PhD, or a bachelor and five years experience, or they can go and fulfill the exceptional ability rule. And now here is the interesting part, extraordinary and exceptional are not the same for USAS. So if extraordinary we saw how is the very top of the field, exceptional is defined as a degree of expertise significantly above that ordinarily encountered in the sciences, arts or business. This standard is lower than the standard for extraordinary ability classification. So here we see clearly how USCIS defines exceptional as being above average, but extraordinary is even higher than that. 
So if you want to either fulfill the EV1 extraordinary ability or in EV2NIW fulfill the exceptional ability, you need to meet at least three out of the 10 criteria that USAIS publishes. Of course, those criteria are different for extraordinary or exceptional, and I can show you quickly where to get that information from. So if you Google, for example, if you want USCIS, one of the first results will be this uh, website where they talk about this employment-based preference if you want category. They define what is extraordinary ability. And here you have the 10 criteria that you can see if, if you meet at least three of them. You must have at least three. In your petition, you will always try to target more than three in case the officer doesn't agree with one or more, uh, you have some um, extra ones, but uh, here is where you can get that information. If you do the same with EB2, you Google EB2 USCIS, one of the first results will be this website, and here in exceptional ability, you have, um, in this case, seven criteria, and you have to meet at least three out of these seven. So I also want to give you an example of the different standards with one of the criterion that is similar for both um, EB1 and EB2. There's one that talks about membership in association. So that one for EB1A says evidence of your membership in associations in the field which demand outstanding achievement of their members. For EB2 it says membership in a professional association. So here you can see the difference very clearly how for EB2 an exceptional ability, the requirement only um, ask of you that you're a member of any professional association. So you can pay a fee for that society, for that professional association, and show them that you are a member in your petition. But for EV1, that's not enough. You cannot just pay a fee and get accepted in that association. You have to prove that you're a member of a society or of an organization that will not only allow anyone to join but they will only allow people based on their high performance to the uh, extraordinary contributions be part of that club of um, extraordinary people so that's quite different and and i think this example really illustrates the differences in terms of um, extraordinary versus exceptional so the the other bigger uh, in my opinion the biggest difference really is what happens with the visa bulletin for these two categories so the visa bulletin and if you want to know more about the visa bulletin and how to interpret it i have a video that i leave a link here but just to give you a brief explanation the visa bulletin determines when you can file for adjustment of status if you are in the us or when you will be called for consular processing if you are abroad Basically, it tells you what is the wait time for your process. Generally, EB1 category has less wait times than EB2, and this is normal because the higher standard, there's going to be less people applying for it, less people that can qualify for it, so there's going to be faster processes. And EB1A is generally a better choice for applicants from India and China because there are long wait times for EB2 for people that are born uh, in those countries and remember that here what matters is the country of birth not the nationality so uh, USAS will look at your country of birth so if you are from China and India right now and in the past years EB2 is not the best option because you have to wait uh, more than I was going to say months but actually years for your adjustment of status but EB1 you don't have that wait time so let's look at an example to really see what are those differences. So this is the uh, table for employment-based green card uh, from the visa bulletin from February 2023. And if we look at this table, basically today we have to focus on the first and second categories. Those are EB1 and EB2, in which we include EB1A and EB2 and IW. And then we have columns for um, the different countries. So we have China, Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, India, Mexico, Philippines, and then the first column is all the countries that are not listed in the other columns. Okay, so what we see is in general, EB1 will have less wait times, for example, 
for all other countries EV1 has a C. C means current. That means that as long as your i140 is approved, you can proceed. Um, actually, even before your i140 is approved, you can proceed for adjustment of status. So it means that there's no wait time currently. So you see that also Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras has a C, also Mexico and Philippines, and China and India have a priority date of June 1st, 2022, which means that only the applicants uh, that file their I-140 before June 1st, 2022 can apply for adjustment of status or will be called for consular processing. But June to now is about half a year wait time. Now let's compare that with EB2. EB2 for China has a priority date of July 2019. So that's two year difference uh, with respect to EB1. And India has May 1st, 2012. That's a 10 year difference in wait time between EB1 and EB2. So you can now see clearly here how what I was saying about India and China um, EB1 is a much more attract attractive option than EB2. For the other countries, we have a very slight wait time for EB2. So generally, EB2 and EB2 NIW is a good option for most people that are not Chinese or Indian. So let's conclude this video. What should you do? That's a question that <laughs> People ask me all the time about everything. What should I do? What should I do? Well, first of all, as I always say, the decision is yours. You have to understand everything and then look at your profile and figure out what's the best option for your personal situation. So what I, what I um, would suggest is that you read more about both this EB1A category and EB2NAW, understand the requirements and decide which one you can qualify for. Maybe you can qualify for both and then you have to think further what you want to do because you can pick one of them or you can actually pick both yes you can submit two i-140 petitions i did it uh, i had two i-140 submitted uh, more or less in the same time range period uh, and you can check out my story in a separate video that i will leave a link over here so what are the factors that will make you decide between one or the other or choose both well first of all your profile of qualifications you have to look at your resume you have to look at your experiences and see can you qualify for only eb2 and aw can you also qualify for eb1 what is your situation then what is your country of birth we just saw how important that is in terms of visa bulletin if you are from india or china eb1 is going to be a much better option for you if you are from other countries, then maybe EB2 and AW makes more sense. And that leads to the last point, which is what is your risk tolerance? What is your urgency? So if you are not from India and China, for sure EB2 and AW is going to be a lower standard to meet. So you're going to have higher chance of success. But if you have a very strong profile, maybe EB1 still makes sense for you. But that's going to be based on your risk tolerance. Can you risk getting a denial or getting um, an RFE if you apply for EB1? Can you afford that extra time that it will take you to maybe respond an RFE or even go back and file EB2 instead? So you have to decide those things by yourself. So tell me, what are your impressions? Are you more interested about EB2 and AW? Are you more interested about EB1? Remember that none of these are specific for scientists. They are open to many professions. So write a comment down below and let me know which one is more appealing to you and why. And also let me know if you want to have more videos about EB1 and learn about this other categories because usually we do focus more on EB2 and AW. So as you know I have a website eb 2 naw.info where you can find a lot of information. You can even download my own I-140 petition, my successful proven I-140 petition and that can help you build your own case. And coming soon is the comprehensive online EB2 and AW course that will be released in February and it will be a step-by-step -step guide with videos and text to really 
uh, make your life much easier than the life people like me had when we applied back in the day for EB2NIW and there, there wasn't so much information out there. So I am looking forward to releasing that um, course and I hope you will find a lot of um, value uh, in it. That being said, thank you for your support. Please subscribe, please share this channel with others and I'll see you in the next video.